I'm going to keep this introduction brief. This is an episode you really need to watch. We sit down with the incredible Nikki Munitz to talk about the release of her new book, Fraud. Nikki is a self-esteem expert, a recovery expert, and uh, I've known Nikki for many, many years from the time I met her at Houghton House. It's something that is quite serious to listen to. We touch on self-esteem, drug use, addiction, prison, and moving through, starting with alcohol, drugs, up to how Nikki ended up on heroin. And this was by the age of 17. So if you're looking at building and developing your self-worth, your self-esteem, this is something you need to listen to. If you are concerned about yourself or someone you care about alcohol or drug use, this is something that you need to listen to. If you're looking for a way to add value and improve the quality of your life, this is something that you need to listen to. And best of all, next week, the same time, 7 a.m. Wednesday morning, South African Standard Time, we're going to have Nikki back live for a live Q&A with you guys, where you'll be able to share your questions and comments on Facebook and on YouTube to ask Nikki about her journey, maybe ask for some advice or about the book or share what you're going through. We're happy to do it either by sharing your comment live on screen or if you put private in the beginning of your message, we will just read the question without sharing your details. Guys, thank you so much. Welcome to Coffee and Conversations with Champions, the Leadership Edition. Recording. We are recording. Excellent. Ooh. Right. So listen, the only real reason that you're here is not to talk about the book. We want to talk about your horsey. Tell us about the horse. Yeah. <laughs> That I can talk about for an hour. <laughs> okay, there, yeah, exactly. There we go. Right. So how, how are we for time? Um, I've got time. I'll, 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 I'll check when we, we're running out of time. We're good. Oh, okay, perfect. All right. So listen, very quickly anyway. So welcome to uh, Coffee and Conversations with Champions because you are a champion. Mm -hmm. We have known you for quite a while, Nick. So from uh, the Houghton House days to training at the gym and then to work that we we've done in different places and you've had really an incredible journey you've helped tens of hundreds of thousands of people you've scared tens of hundreds of thousands of people and uh so I think, give us a little bit of a background as to who you are who is nikki and yeah, uh, yeah we'll chat about the book we'll chat about you and uh, sure. what what i want to do with this is as we said, we'll do we'll put this out now, pre-recorded, and then we're going to do a live one next week where people can come on, ask questions, and chat. Sure. So, which will be absolutely epic. Cool. Who is so, Nikki? I mean, I think it's really awesome that I get to do this with you because you've been along for a huge part of the ride um, of me becoming me, <laughs> um, and you know, if you had asked me this question. I don't know, a year ago, I'm not sure I would have been able to answer it as clearly as, as I can today. Um, and today I know that who I am is someone who is courageous, uh, who um, is intelligent, um, and who is really committed to helping people change their lives, um, because anything is possible. A hundred percent. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, we met when you were working as a counselor at Houghton House. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think very highly respected, highly valued by your colleagues, but also primarily by the patients. And I think that's really where it counts. And yeah. not to joke, uh, you know, you scared them a little bit yeah. because you didn't take nonsense. Um, I'm watching the language here because we run this as a non-explicit uh, podcast. <laughs> but so, I, I can contain myself, so, don't worry. So, okay, no, 100%. So, you know, the, yeah. the thing, and, and that's, so can, can you tell us a little bit about your journey? 
Sure. It's, it's so interesting you bring up Houghton because mm. it was such a massive part of me really finding my space in the counseling uh, mm. world. And at the same time, internally, I was so insecure, but no one who knew me would have actually known that at nope, all. Not a chance. Um, and being short as I am, I wore high heels all the time and people would hear me coming with these clip, 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 and they'd be terrified. <laughs> and people often talk about it. And, yeah. you know, I had this like outer, uh, you know, shield and internally I was actually like quite a softie. And I think mm. this journey of becoming for me is being able to be authentically myself where I can show the loving, caring side of myself, but I still take no nonsense, you know, so uh, I, I'm yeah. direct. <laughs> so I, I think just, just to share with you, I mean, you did a very good job of that because no one really knew, but even then you were loving and caring, mm. but took no nonsense. Mm. So, you know, I think that's, the, the, the work that you've done on yourself, you, you, you've been able to, um, you know, in early stages, still share the best part of yourself. So yeah. let, let's talk a little bit about that journey. So what is the journey, your journey been? Sure. Um, so I was actually speaking about it this morning at gym. And I just said, um, you know, like I would have probably been voted least likely to make a mess of their lives. I was really like, I did well at school. I wasn't a problem child. I had colors for every sport I did. I had academic colors. I had friends. I suppose I, I knew how to wear a mask uh, from very, very early on. I just, mm. whatever I was showing to the world was almost the antithesis of what I was feeling internally. Um, and sure. when I got to about, you know, 15, 16 years old and, you know, I just couldn't, the mask was becoming quite a burden for me and, and feeling so lost and like, I just didn't belong. I didn't fit anywhere and feel like I fit in my family or in my friends or anywhere. And, mm. you know, then I started finding the crowd that I felt just accepted me for who I was. And of course it wasn't the crowd that we want our children to be hanging out with. Um, and well, I mean, I, a, a crowd of, of, of lost, broken people. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. And I uh, started drinking, um, as I think many teenagers start doing. And I just, I really felt like I'd found my space, not coffee. <laughs> um, yeah. And the progression of me f finding ways to get out of myself mm. um, just continued from there, whether it was with boys or whether it was alcohol and eventually cocaine and heroin, um, you know, it didn't. <laughs> really like matter to me as long as yeah. it was doing it's you know serving its purpose um you know can, and, can we chat a little bit about that progression because i think and, and you're a mom so and, i mean you've got four kids so two children a husband and a, a horse and, and some colleagues and i mean so you've probably got about eight nine thousand children so but from, from a parent's point of view i think th that's quite a scary process to see yeah. and it doesn't mean just because your kid drinks, they're only going to drink. Just because they smoke dope, they're only going to smoke. So what was that progr the progression for you? What, what drove that? You know, it's, it's so interesting. And I actually talk about it in um, my book around, because I grew up uh, around addiction. My, my eldest brother is an addict and I grew up in tough love and uh, nar and non. And what, I just grew up around it. I always had this mm. belief that, marijuana was the gateway drug <laughs> so i skipped it was the weirdest thing i, I, I drank first and yeah. then i went straight to like ecstasy and then cocaine and okay. then to marijuana because right. i thought that was the gateway into but, addiction but but a hundred percent i mean that for our generation right yeah. um you know the that was drummed into our heads at school and mm. i think it was i mean there were i remember i, I forget her name the mom that was she lost her son to drugs and it was mar and that story of speaking like that's the bad drug you know yeah. heroin's yeah. fine just don't do marijuana so okay so so what made you move from alcohol to ecstasy to heroin um, I, I think or well, first i want to just speak about yeah. children because just yeah. because your child is experimenting also doesn't mean that they're going to go down a path of addiction yeah. so you know for me it's important to recognize that 
the issues surrounding addiction, aside from, you know, a genetic predisposition, trauma is mm. a big aspect, um, an inability to communicate effectively, um, to acknowledge feelings and any issues that mm. you're having that you're trying to escape from. Those are the issues, not the fact that someone's experimenting, because experimentation yeah. is normal um, yes. and a very much part of developmental growth for a, for a teenager. Mm. Um, I think our big issue is that alcohol and marijuana um, are seen as okay. And in actual fact, they're probably the two scariest drugs. Yeah, 100%. Exist. Yeah, one. I mean, we've seen that over the years of these wonderful, bright kids that come in when they're 17 and 18 and by the, they keep coming back with their marijuana mm. addiction. And, you know, 10 years down the line, they can't string a sentence together. You know, Absolutely. It's, it's, it's also terrifying. different when we were smoking marijuana it was like we bought it from the petrol attendant you know yeah. and now it's genetically modified you don't even it's it's like not even a plant anymore i don't know what no, it is no. like what we're seeing is pretty terrifying sure. actually mm. um, so uh, how did i go along well i think you know in our generation it was the rave scene so ecstasy was just kind of the next <laughs> natural progression um in and it, terms was, it was a big thing i mean that was your social life right Absolutely. it was the and, and you didn't go to a rave without taking ecstasy no uh, and it was really considered the love drug you know yeah. with alcohol you'd get into fights and but, they would yeah. cry. That's, yeah. that <laughs> and was the narrative huh yeah ecstasy everyone's loving each other and hugging each other and you know it's all wonderful yeah yeah um, and I really, I mean, from that time, I have a lot of fun, fond memories, but mm. honestly, the feeling, it was never enough. Mm. Um, I wanted more <laughs> all the time. And I suppose that that was kind of the, the next step, how it progressed for me. Mm. Um, you know, with ecstasy, the come down was really hard. Um, you know, this real depression setting in. Mm. Um, and so a way to avoid that was to not come down. <laughs> Yeah. And, and but and, and to say that like the coming down the depression yeah. that's on top of the negative stuff you're already feeling about yourself right absolutely absolutely you know, so you um, really don't it's not like a, a, a weakness of character to no. say i don't want to come down it's like really compounding how yeah. you're feeling i mean honestly negative. like uh, you would uh, our person would be suicidal yeah if, the biggest party over the weekend happy as anything and by tuesday i was ready to off myself yeah you know? um and you, and you burn up all your happiness in a short space and you have nothing left and totally. like, it, it's a That's terrifying true. space to be huh? but also you're like kind of flying high and then yeah. you come down to earth and yeah. it feels like a million miles apart so yeah. it just it, it was really hard and like you said coupled with how i was really feeling it kind of gets magnified and it was horrible and um you know for me a huge foundation of the work that i do and, and why i do it was because mm. i had self-esteem issues um mm. as i think a huge majority of people do um and when i found cocaine i thought that i'd mm. found like oh this is a, the answer you know gave me a sure. huge amount of confidence i could talk to anyone mm -hmm. i felt i was the best dancer the best speaker the best everything you know um and again because i just loved that feeling so much i just wanted more and more of it and of course it's not a cheap exercise mm. no. um, and so in order to manage that for myself mm. to be able to you know say okay it's enough i don't have any more money that's how heroin kind of came into the picture for me <laughs> it was like okay this is how we actually end the night this is how right. we can sleep and you know the person who introduced me just minimized how hectic it was they're like it's not like you see in the movies. It's really mm. not that hectic. You know, you'll mm. be able to go to sleep. And essentially, I trusted this person. Um, and so I tried it. And it wasn't like I saw in the movies, you know. And it, there weren't massive consequences in the beginning. Although, mm. um, I mean, if I think back about it, it, it was, I persevered. It wasn't that great in the beginning, but I persevered. Yeah. That's, <laughs> you know, it's. It's the it's the thing where we need to be so careful in that environment, but you can't really be careful in that environment because it's like I was the guy at the bar at the party encouraging everyone to drink, encouraging everyone to try shots. Like that was me because I didn't want to be doing it alone because I felt so bad about myself. 
And in hindsight, it's a very difficult thing to say because you're getting people to not really do what they wanted to do because you didn't want to drink alone. And yeah. it's like, it's fine. It's not so bad. Try it. Mm. I think that, that's, you know, if you've got someone that's constantly encouraging you to try stuff, ask really what's, why, why I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Sure, but I, I think, you know, by that stage, I was so already in the, mm. you know, the stronghold of the addiction, um, like the illness taking over yeah. me. That didn't matter. I, it didn't matter. And, yeah. and I don't think I had the ability to say no. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I didn't realize is that although the other drugs had this really strong, uh, like mental pull on me, heroin had a physical pull, which I didn't understand. Yeah. Um, and within three days, I was in trouble. Okay, uh, sure. like that's how quickly it took hold for mm. me. Um, and within two weeks of me starting heroin, I, my life was already a shambles. I was at university. I was missing classes. Um, I was stealing from work. I, mm. You know, it, it was so quick. Um, mm. Mm. And the the person who introduced me to, to heroin, we, we just had a discussion. We were like, we're going to have this huge party. We need to say goodbye to it because we can't carry on like this. And um, we did that. And the next day I was house sitting. I mean, this is the genius of it all. I was house sitting. Mm house uh, my boss's house which was across the road from my mother's house and i was meant to be at a 7 a.m lecture at varsity and of course i was not at a 7 a.m and my car was still there and so she obviously started to realize more and more the severity of the problem mm. and um that day i woke up the, the the gardener had left my mother into the house and i woke up to my mother and three policemen and my brother standing over me <laughs> um sure. you know kind of my mom, my mom wanting to have me arrested and my brother saying listen you know she's she's not even 18 yet can we just like calm down okay. um, and you know try something else first mm -hmm. um and yeah that was kind of the the beginning of the spiral and i had this love affair with heroin for five years you know in and out of rehab you know, my mother sent me overseas to visit my brother in Australia to help me stop. I left here in withdrawal, found heroin there and came back in withdrawal. I mean, like, mm. we know we can, you can put me on the moon and I'll find a way to, to <laughs> like, get what I'm looking for. Yeah. Um, but, I think, you know, that's also our superpower because if we want to be sober, if we want to recover, we, we, we have the skills to do whatever we need to do to use. We have the skills to stop. I think, can, can we touch on um, just the physiological aspect of the addiction with heroin? So sure. if people watching can, like, what, what, one, what is it? And then what does that feel like? Sure. I think withdrawal is something you never really physically and then emotionally as well go through. So, you know, I'm always reluctant to kind of try and explain to people the good part of heroin, because of course there was a good part, otherwise we wouldn't have carried on. Um, it really felt like euphoria. Um, it felt like every problem I ever had melted away from me. Mm. And, you know, I was sitting with absolute peace. Um, and, you know, there was a study that was done on, on baby guinea pigs, and I always refer back to it. These guinea pigs would mm. scream their heads off when you took them away from their mothers. Um, and then they started giving these guinea pigs heroin, the babies, and they wanted nothing to do with their mothers anymore after that. Mm. Um, and that's the best way that I can explain it. It gives you the thing that you feel you've been missing in your life. Mm -hmm. um, and then it becomes like having a you're a slave right so you're sick all the time if you can imagine the worst possible flu i mean heroin addicts hated when i describe it like this because it feels so minimized but yeah. it, oops, there's vomiting there's sweating mm. there's zero energy you know you're basically dragging yourself around until you use again mm. um, and that's why so many heroin addicts struggle to get clean they don't even get through the withdrawal um and the interesting part is that you don't really die heroin withdrawal dying from heroin withdrawal is very very few and far between whereas alcohol and um benzodiazepine tranquilizers those are the life-threatening uh, detoxes um, but heroin addicts certainly feel like they're dying <laughs> when, when it's happening and it's a good like five days hectic but mm -hmm. two weeks of really not feeling okay not sleeping 
um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's unpleasant. And, and each time you do it, it gets worse. Okay. Um, yeah. So I mean, it, it, and then on top of all of that, it's the mental stuff again, as to why you started, you know, and I think that th that progression, it's just, I've never, as I tell people, I've never met a bad person in recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, it, well, and, and that's in the rooms. Right, going to meetings. I've never met. I've met very good people who have done very bad things, mm. because it's just like you. You not yourself. You not. And I think maybe like four parents, four family, four support members. Mm. You know, it's it's. We really become who we don't want to be in sobriety. Uh, I I wanted to ask you about the that euphoria and finding yourself and filling that hole. Like, mm. how's it been now in sobriety? How's it like? I just want to talk around the anxiety around the book and the coming out and the fear and the. But so, like, let let's put it into perspective, right? Running a family, running yeah. a business, yeah. writing a book, building a career as well. Because I know you've got a lot of stuff coming yeah. out still. Fight. To, time to ride a horse waking up early to go to gym in the morning and your coach is is not the the most chilled relaxed oh it's fine you look a little bit tired today let's take it easy so like yeah. all of this immense pressure and to, but like how does that feel now compared yeah. to then um so i think for a long time into mm. my recovery i still didn't feel peace mm. um i uh you know, when just, you know, my story, I landed up going to prison, which obviously we'll mm. talk about. But yeah. before I went to prison, I had got to a point in my recovery and certainly very much more when I came out of prison of like, is this it? And I was eight years clean already at that point. Um, and just really not liking myself, um, even though I was doing all this good work and outwardly, I mean, I looked good, I trained hard, I helped people. But inwardly, I felt the complete opposite. Um, and only after learning about having a relationship with myself um, in like, I'm the most important person in my life, because if I don't have this relationship with me, mm. there is nothing else. And how I get to this point where I'm building a business and I do what I love and, you know, I can have a family and have it all, mm. essentially is all based on the relationship I have with me. Um, that's the starting point. Why is that? And, and uh, it sounds like a silly question. Why is that such an important foundation? I mean, that is the foundation, right? Yeah. And it goes back to you can't love anyone until you love yourself. Yeah. And you, you can try and you can think it's love, but it's a mm -hmm. why is that so important? So I think that's the core of your work, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we are taught from uh, like babies that um, you know initially it's our parents responsibility to love us because we can do nothing for ourselves mm. or our caregivers and then our parents are meant to teach us how to love ourselves <laughs> but we're being taught by people who also don't know how to love themselves so instead they teach us if you have the right job the right house the right car mm. the right whatever all will be well and then I get those things and I still don't feel okay. And then I'm like, okay, well, then I must be broken because <laughs> I have all of these things and I still don't feel good. You know, uh, that's, that, so uh, that's such a valid point because all of those things are ticking the boxes for your parents to fill the boxes that they weren't able to tick for their parents. Absolutely. Who weren't able to tick those boxes. And, and that, that's it. It's like might have nothing to do with us, right? Absolutely. So I'm living to keep other people happy for mm. other people's approval. Essentially, my whole self is built on other people's opinions of me. Yeah. Oof. And right? the, the, yeah. And there's nothing more painful in the world. Nothing more painful because, you know, today you might have a great opinion of me and tomorrow you might not. So I'm like a hostage in that mm. situation and I'm trying to perform like a circus animal to try and get your approval. Um, and I'm not doing things that make me happy, that make me fulfilled. I'm trying to do things for, you know, the applause, <laughs> for the yeah. acknowledgement. Um, and, and, and it's not even applause or acknowledgement. It's just that uh, you're doing things so that you can feel you have a right to exist. Absolutely. And, right. and where that like, stems from is mm. this belief that I don't, you know, as a baby, I 
deserve love, you know, because mm-hmm. I don't know any different. <laughs> Someone yeah. needs to love me. Mm-hmm. Um, and somehow as I grow up, I, that belief changes for me. I think because, mm-hmm. you know, I'm now a bigger version of myself that I don't deserve the same type of love. And the reason I, I think I believe that is because, you know, no one actually tells me what love actually is. Yeah. And no one explains to me that we need love, like we need oxygen in order mm-hmm. to survive. Yeah. You know, my husband went through a process of adopting my children when we were working um, with a social worker. She explained that babies brought up in orphanages will bang their heads on a crib in order to get one of the carers to come pick them up. It's so instinctual that yeah. need for love that, you know, that's how it actually manifests. It's, it's crazy, right? Mm. And we are born with the, I always tell my clients, an empty bowl inside our stomachs, which, I, you know, we try and fill with sex, drugs, and rock and roll, yeah. right? And it just makes the hole bigger. Mm. Um, mm. And what that bowl is actually meant for is for love. Um, and I need to learn how to fill that bowl in order, I always tell my clients, it's like a chocolate fountain. I need the love to be overflowing so that other people can come and kind of dip their strawberry in and get covered by the love. Yes. Otherwise, it's just like this random trickle. Mm-hmm. Um, and I try and give that away in order to get something back in return. And it's actually the opposite of what I need to be doing. How important in that is actually understanding what love actually is? Okay. It's, it's yeah. absolutely fine because the reality is we get taught nonsense about love. We get taught fairy tales and rom coms and mm. you know, like love at first sight. It, it, like Warm if I fuzzies, I, we, we get we get taught to look for chemical responses to others. Absolutely, yeah. and if you ask people what is love, mm. they stare at you blankly, like. It's a feeling you just know, uh, you know, and it's like this thing that we all want. We all crave it, but we know diddly about it. Yeah. Um, and in actual fact, it's really practical. Love is a verb. It mm-hmm. is an action. <laughs> exactly. Correct. But I think also it's like lo- love is, yeah, I think, do you think we, we end up defining what love is for ourselves around the core principle of what love is so love means something slightly different to others to, um, to different people i, don't think, so. I, okay. I think that love is an umbrella term in mm. my opinion um and that there are a whole bunch of other verbs that fall under this umbrella like respect uh, like mm. trust like communication um and like hundreds of other mm, verbs mm, mm. and when we learn how to engage with those elements towards ourself, then we two things happen. One is I teach people how I want to be loved because I model it. Mm-hmm. Sure. And I also recognize it when it's there. Um, because a lot of the time what people describe as love is often either infatuation or trauma mm-hmm. bonds or things like yeah. that, you know, instead of actual love. Sure. Mm. I mean, and how dangerous is infatuation and trauma bonds because you start to sacrifice yourself in order not to lose that. I mean, it's like heroin. You start to give everything away of who you are, your worth, your value, your safety in order not to lose those relationships. Yeah. Well, I didn't talk about that. I, I married yeah. a bond, my first husband, mm-hmm. um, who I met in, in rehab. I mean, the whole story is, I mean, I've got two beautiful children out of the whole experience, but I also landed up stealing money to try and get this person to love me more um, and going to prison because of it. I mean, that's yeah. the kind of hold that it actually had on me. I think, thank God he didn't ask me to murder anyone because I probably might, may have considered that as well. Mm. <laughs> um, right. And that's not love. Yeah. That's not love. So what, what, what were, if we can talk about, what were you feeling at that time? I mean, because I think you, 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 you've developed an incredible self-awareness. So you understand what you're thinking, why you're thinking, what, what was the thoughts that was leading you to, I know this is, is were you thinking, you know, this is wrong, but you're going to do it anyway, or I can, you know, because for me, like it, it was, it can do anything wrong and we can justify it because yes, it's wrong. I need to do it now and then I'll fix it later. Exactly. That was yeah. exactly the thinking. Yeah. 
<laughs> I need to do this now. And I will, I will put the money back. I will fix it later. Like, yeah. and I really I'll put the it. money I'm, back. I wasn't lying. I was hundred yeah. percent like honest with myself. That's yeah. what I really believed. Um, mm. But it very much like using, I, I thought I had control. I had no control. Yeah. Um, that was a runaway like train that I was on and I couldn't stop. Um, so it and, was another, it was like an, it was another drug, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, equally destructive, probably yeah. more destructive for me. Um, and yeah, it just, it was once I had the first hit, <laughs> um, there was kind of no going back from there. Yeah. Because, you know, it's, I love what you do now, right? You yeah. teach people how to develop their self esteem, self love, yeah. self worth, self respect. You, you teach them first to find out who they are, right? Show them who they are and then show them the value in that. And, and that's really what we're looking for when we do any of this. Yeah. You know, uh, for me at, at, at the Kagan Beagle, what, you know, it's like I love the term local. Yeah, you know, mm. locals are a, a term for for drunk, because mm. if you're a local, you're always at the pub. There was one guy I know that used to come in there that I don't think was a drunk, and he'd come in, sit quietly, read his newspaper, have his Guinness, and leave. And he would do that once every two or three weeks. Mm. Everyone else that was always there, a good friend of mine, Robbie Cohen, said to me, I said to him, I love the keg. There's always someone there to have a drink with, and that for me was looking for that connection, right? Absolutely. to be loved to connect to and he said yeah it's you you know and and that's what was what started the process of hang on i might not be in the best place for me with this mm. so you know i wanted to l l let's talk about the book um, yeah. your title sure okay <laughs> you're not pulling any punches hey All right. how do i get on the camera yeah. there that's go. perfect that's awesome hey and by the way that's fraud guys not freud um <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And that's a very, very <laughs> courageous title. And it's yeah. also a hundred percent Nikki Munitz. No punches pulled. No, you know, like we actually really didn't struggle to come up with a title at mm. all. Um, because for me that really describes my journey. Um, I felt like a fraud from as far back as I could remember. Mm. What I showed people versus what was really going on inside me was not the same thing. And it took going to prison and doing a course on self-esteem to like find me um, and the authentic sure. me. Yeah. Sure. And that was my real freedom. Um, not, not like letting go of using drugs, not coming out of prison. My freedom was becoming me, be giving myself permission to be me. Sure. And, yeah. and, and loving you. Absolutely. You. Absolutely. Yeah. I think the, the love that we seek so desperately is the love that we can give ourselves. It only comes from ourselves. Everything else is a bonus. Everything else is a bonus, 100%. Mm -hmm. So why, what made you write the book? I mean, it's not like you're not busy enough, right? <laughs> Listen, I to be... What time does your day start? Uh, it's pretty much the same time as your day starts. Yeah, there we go. Okay, what time does it end? <laughs> Late. Yeah. No, no, dude, okay. I'm in bed by 7.38, so I'm, my life is much easier. So, all right. So, all of this going on in your life, building this okay. career, building the family, running. Why the book? So, um, I, my, my best friend, Elka, um, mm. who she's been my friend through a huge majority of my life we've been friends since we were 14 um you know she was doing some work with my social media team and um she was kind of lost her mojo a little bit and so i encouraged her to do a writing course which really helped her get her mojo back and then she did the same for me <laughs> uh, awesome. but i think it was all <clears throat> kind of our this process of coming together um of finding a way to, to get the story out there. And I, I, you know, I begged her for years to write the book. 
um, even though like from the time I started, I was pregnant with my daughter, who's now 18, when I started asking her to write the book for me. Mm -hmm. um, and she said, no, anyway, we did this writing course and Melinda Ferguson, who hosted the writing mm -hmm. course was also a publisher. She said, um, at the end of the writing course, she said, you guys need to write this book. And I say you guys, because Elka has an incredible talent for writing and you've got an incredible story. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I'd love to say that I took up countless hours of my life. I mean, I sat many hours with Elka, you know, we had to, she had to get into my head as mm -hmm. much as she knew the story. She wasn't me and she had to almost be, she had to become me to write mm -hmm. the story. Um, and she gave up months of her life. Um, I think her husband and her children had to relearn her name and who she was, <laughs> what she looked like. Um, she really put in the hard yards of actually writing the book you know um and for me it was a process of like stepping back because i can get really controlling and you know really? I, no i don't know what you've heard that's not true <laughs> Um, I'm, just, I'm just looking at the camera chatting to your coach going because we, we both had the opportunity to train you in the gym it's like oh really Nikki, oh wow okay yeah she's just, not a walkover hey? <laughs> okay yeah uh, um and yeah it was just this incredible journey of reliving it um and it was hard reliving mm. the story um because be, I'm used to kind of telling it from an unemotional point of view. And in order to write the book, I had to get back in there. Um, and she struggled. Mm. I mean, it, which, there was a period where she, she wrote about like the really dark stuff. And she was like, I'm in a dark space. And I'm like, because yep, she's feeling that for something like with something she's so connected to, right? Absolutely. And, and she really, like she immersed, mm. she became me. I, I mm. wish I could explain it. It was yeah. a, a somewhat bizarre experience. Um, like if sure. I had written the book completely myself, I would, there's nothing I would change. Um, mm. Mm. You know, she, she captured each and every feeling, each and every experience, like accurately. Um, and yeah, I mean, putting the book together was hard. You know, I there were things that I've said about my family that, yeah. um, you know, I had to reread it and I'm like, yikes, guys, this is it's quite hectic. There were things that the legal um, team at the publisher were like, oh, you know, we need to take this out or change that, mm -hmm. um, you know, and just owning parts of my story that I hadn't really spoken about Um you know, uh, those parts are hard. And and funnily enough, um, not one of my family members have said anything except my mother yesterday. She was like, I'm proud of you. And I'm really disconnected from her. I don't have a relationship with her at all. Um, and I, I said, thank you. But in my head, I'm thinking, uh, I'm telling the truth about you in this book. I you know, hope you're ready for it. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, listen, um, listen, I think, but the book is honesty, right? And I mean, yeah. you are, it's on, it's going to be an opportunity for her to heal or ignore. It, it, it may you know? be, but yeah. it, it for me, the, the end game of the book is for yeah. other people to, to yeah. heal, to have hope. Um, it, it was a book of, you know, showing how no matter each period of my life, how dark mm. it was, there were actually like people of light who carried me through. I couldn't see it at the time, mm. but mm. writing the book, this incredible thread of humans that kept showing up for me in the most bizarre places and ways. Um, and like, I wanted to share that with people. Like mm. you all have those people in your life. Yeah. Like 100%. trust, never alone. That craving for connection that we have, just mm. try, you are not alone. <laughs> You're up 100%. You know, that's so let's work. Who is the book for? I mean, did you write it for a specific person, group thing, or is it just for, you know, who, who, so who did you write it for? And then also looking at your experience mm -hmm. with counseling and with work and with helping people develop, you know, just off the subject, we, we run a, a self esteem is the number one self defense in the world. Absolutely. Forget karate, forget judo, forget jiu-jitsu, forget becoming a Navy SEAL. All of that, that's a, the number one. Mm. 
mm. you know and usually the guys who end up in those high positions have the self-esteem because of it like this is the number one self-defense work that you can do so mm-hmm. yeah so who who's the book for the who? book is for anyone who feels helpless hopeless <laughs> um lost confused uh you know anyone who is curious about the possibility of change um, right yeah uh, sure. i really believe that that's how we've put the story together of course there's going to be those who are just curious about my story and what unfolded and that's okay too um, yeah. <laughs> good reading 100 <laughs> <laughs> percent. so just turning the phone is on vibrate but i'm to so you know the let, let me ask you this question then what would you need to say to 14 year old you in order to get you to read the book sure that's a big question it's what i do (laughs) (laughs) i would say to 14 year old me um, life is bumpy and you're going to need to fasten your seatbelt but you are loved and it's all going to be okay. Okay. So a hundred, but why read the book? (sighs) To know, you you know, how I explain something to my clients and how I explain it to 14 year old me is that, you know, when we're looking at something, we look like with a magnifying glass at that specific part Mm -hmm. of the story. And then we need to take a step back and look at the whole story and to know that it's a moving, it's a moving object. Like it's constantly evolving. And I would just say, get some perspective, whatever you're going through now, Mm -hmm. just what you're going through now, read the book to get perspective on life and to know that this is not how the story ends. (laughs) It's not how the story ends. Just keep going. 100%. 100%. That's yeah. sure. The, you know, and I think it, it, it's a book that, like, and I haven't read the book because, you know, we, we, we both know my relationship with reading um, is a challenging one. And uh, just from my dyslexia, my ADHD, my all of this, which is why I love audiobooks. So looking forward it's to getting coming. you on audiobook. It's so coming. Excellent. Uh, the, the the thing with this book and from knowing you i can say this with confidence it's like it's a book that a parent could read or should read parents and then give to their kids and then chat about so uh, kids that need to listen to this because i think let me let me say yeah yeah because here here's the thing right that Sometimes we think that our challenges are mm. the worst in the world and that are overpowering and that are crazy. And then when we, we see what the world is really about, we mm. realize our challenges aren't so tough. Mm. But not to say that we, we're blowing it up, but to say that we're actually far more capable of surviving than we realize. And, mm. you know, th- that's the thing. And I think, unfortunately, like, being sheltered is not always a good thing because you realize you can't deal with anything you know there's a certain school in the area where with quite young moms and watching them freak out about parking space and i understand there's a lot of stress and pressure and watching them fight one another in Mm -hmm. the park where there's real stuff that's going on you know and the more you're exposed to about the reality in a safe and appropriate way Mm. the stronger you realize you can be yeah so that's amazing and on that note i do have to run no no i know so let's just say this very quickly i've got two minutes i mean yes. timing is okay next week we're going to get you back on we're going to do a live q a and i think we need to get as many people in watching this it is going to be at a challenging time but let's be honest if you're at work put on your headphones let everyone else think you're working and then <laughs> tune in and watch this because it could well here's here's two things i just want to finish on it could Mm. save your life but Mm. more importantly it could save the quality of your life uh i couldn't say it better than that i'm really excited about that wake up early and join yes absolutely so we're going to do it 7 a.m 
Again. Yes, yeah. excellent. All right. Next, and we're going to put it out internationally as well. Thank you for your time. I know you're really pressured. And, mm -hmm. you know, just, dude, thank you for being you. Thank you for what you've done. And thank you for the lives that you saved. Um, I kind of want to say that right, right back at you um, because I feel equally privileged to have been part of your uh, growth process and watching you. Um, and it's been inspirational. It's beautiful. It's very kind of you. So it's a, it's a wonderful, it's a far better place to be. Yep. All right, my friend, I'm going to end it there. Then I'll say goodbye.